Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. Everybody look at your hands. Oh, we can dance. Oh, we can dance. Everybody's taking the chance. It's safe to dance. Oh, it's safe to dance. It's safe to dance. Hello and welcome to episode 236 of the Situational Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. And like last week, I'm still on vacation here in my motorhome. Last week I was in North Carolina, this week I'm in Tennessee. We came to watch the leaves change, but as with all things with Mother Nature, uh, she had a uh, different idea and we kind of missed it by about a week, but we're still relaxing and enjoying ourselves. Um, I'm recording this episode on a Friday night because tomorrow I'm leaving to do two programs in Alberta. Yes, even on vacation, the SA Matters mission doesn't rest completely. In today's feature segment, it's a continuation of a series of flashback episodes I'm running from the early days of the SA Matters show. When I first launched the show back in 2014, we had some amazing guests who shared some incredible near-miss stories. The problem is the show was new, really new, and we didn't have a followership yet. Well, at least not like the followership we have today. So I want to give the listeners and viewers who weren't with us back then an opportunity to learn from some of those powerful stories. Now, for those who are watching the episode on the SA Matters TV YouTube channel, the interview coming up is audio only segment because back then I wasn't recording videos of the interviews. It was only audio. Everything leading up to the interview and everything following the interview, that will be video. Okay, let's jump into my feature segment, a flashback with my interview with firefighter John D'Antuano as he recounts a story of falling through the floor at a residential dwelling fire, which then led to a mayday and his rescue. Well, it was uh, it was a drill night for us, uh, regular drill uh, that we had weekly. Uh, a fire went out, a call for a fire went out in uh, one of our uh, neighboring areas um, that we, we've worked not too closely with, but we've been there a few times um, and uh, we're, we're familiar with their operations, et cetera. Um, we were called to... Uh, supply one engine with manpower. They had a uh, working structure fire. It was a, uh, a, a farm type house that had fallen into quite a bit of disrepair. Um, it was uh, two story. Um, it, it was a very good size on a good sized piece of property. Um, <clears throat> we responded uh, with an engine again and uh, a total of six people. Now, we, we had a very experienced crew that night. Our driver, uh, past chief, 40 plus years, captain on the apparatus that evening, uh, past chief also, 30 plus years, myself with 40 plus years, and uh, three other firefighters. One ha happens to be my son, with uh, five to 10 years experience each. Um, so 
we were we were around the block. We we been to a few alarms, and uh, and I I would say we knew what we had to do. Um, it was a uh, it was a fairly long response uh, for us. Um, and on the way in, we're we're listening to the radio transmission. What's what's fairly long response, John? That's all um, relative. Okay, it, it was probably. Uh, I would say a 10 to 12 minute response. Okay. And you guys were already at the station because it was drill night. Yes. Okay. Okay. Keep going. And um, so again, during the response, we're we're listening to the uh, we're listening to the radio transmissions uh, from fire ground to uh, county fire control. And um, and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be great. You know, they've already got hose lines in play. It doesn't look like we're going to have to uh, worry about stretching any supply lines and or hand lines. Um, we finally find the, uh, the scene of the incident. We get called in, and we probably had to walk, oh, maybe – 25 to 50 yards from our apparatus into the scene. Uh, everybody had a complement of hand tools. Uh, the officer was doling out duties. Um, myself and uh, firefighter Brian Ham helped uh, set up a ground ladder. And uh, I had failed to mention earlier, our, our chief of department was in route also uh, on this alarm. Um, he came up to us after we had the ground ladder secured and uh, guys were going into operation on that. Um, said, listen, would you guys mind going up? And that would be me and uh, firefighter Dan Kadlebowski, uh go upstairs and uh, help with some pulling ceilings and, and checking for extension. Uh, they got a crew working in a back bedroom on the uh, BC side of the structure. I um, think there may be extension. Why don't you guys go up and see what kind of hand you can lend. Uh, we, we take all our tools up with us that we're going to need, uh, make the way upstairs. Uh, Chief is right behind us and uh, gives the orders, okay, let's start opening up here. And we're opening up, and we're, we're finding nothing. The guys in the fire room, in the bedroom, are making a good knock on the fire. Um, keep in mind, I said this house was in quite a bit of disrepair. Um, at one point... Was it we, vacant? Yes, it was a vacant. Okay. At one point, um, we stopped with the pulling, of the ceilings and, and opening up the walls. Can, hold on, before you, um, before you get too far down that road, when you guys were on the outside when you arrived, what were you seeing? Uh, not a lot of fire because when we entered through the A side, uh, there was some smoke upstairs. Most of the most of the fire was on the uh, B C side. And uh, the, the, the flame and smoke was emanating mainly from that side. So when we walked in, it was relatively calm. We didn't put on any masks until we got up to the second floor trying to, you know, uh, preserve our air supply. Um, and when we got up there and, and started working, um, at one point we had checked to see if uh, what the CO levels were. We, we were able to take our, our masks off. Uh, and, and it wasn't, again, it wasn't that bad. Um, so at one point, like I had mentioned earlier, we had stopped with the uh, checking for extension. Now I turned to my chief and I said, would you mind if I go and check a couple other areas that nobody has gone to yet? Um, he says, yeah, I've got no problem, John. He says, do what you got to do. Just report back to me if you find anything. You got it, Chief. Um, so on 
my way, I go. I go over to the D side. I see nothing there. Now, uh, you're on the inside? I'm on the, and we're back on the interior now, yes, sir. And when you go, when you clear this with him and you go, are you going alone? Uh, yes, because we are probably no more than 20 feet away. Okay. And where I was going, uh, smoke condition was very, very minimal. So we had, we had good uh, line of sight uh, view of each other. Okay. You said it was uh, a large house, so I couldn't quite put in my mind yeah. how, how large in comparison to what you're saying you're doing now. Okay. So, as, uh, again, I checked the D side, and uh, there was um, nothing going on there. And I walk over to the A side. Uh, I leave the room that we were working in. I go through a doorway. I take two steps, and the next thing I know, I am through the floor. Um, it was that quick. It was like you were blinking your eye. Um, immediately through my mind, uh, it, it's running, you know, okay, John, and I'm, I'm literally checking all my pieces of my body in my mind. Okay. You got both arms. I can feel both legs. If it were not for my SCBA pack, I probably would have fallen through the floor onto a crew that was working on the first floor. Uh, I was pretty shaken up about this. I did call a May Day on my radio, but I'm not sure if it was heard, but I did hear the uh, outside operations chief said, we've got a firefighter down. We've got a firefighter down. Get a crew up to the second floor. Um, the, the scary part about that was as I'm checking myself and my feet are dangling through the floor, I'm trying to hoist myself up with my elbows to, to back myself out of the hole that I had just made. Here comes this other firefighter. Um, I do not remember what department. He lands right in front of me to help me. Now, this floor is severely compromised. Um, can, can I ask you... Um, was it rot or fire damage? It was rot. Okay. And uh, so the fire wasn't right below you, and that's what no, caused it. No. Okay. No. All right. Keep going. This this other firefighter. Um, again, I said the floor was you know severely compromised. He comes in front of me to my aid, and and I probably would have done the same thing. Um. The main thing that I was concerned about now with his weight so close to me, is this floor going to give way and are we going to end up on the guys below? Uh, did you they, know there were guys below you at that point? Did I? Yes, I did. I, I knew that there was a crew working down there. Because um, could, could they see your feet dangling through the floor? Yes, they could. As a matter of fact, it was the captain of our rig who called for a ladder um, to get a, uh, a ground ladder in there so I could get my feet on the ground ladder and have have a little bracing, if you will. So the um, captain was below you? Yes. Okay. Working with a, working with a crew. Great. Okay. Um, our chief was about four steps behind me when he heard the crash. He had the presence of mind to grab my uh, SCBA shoulder straps and hold me until, like I said, that ground ladder was placed underneath my feet so I could have a little bit of uh, support underneath me. Um, with that, uh, I was able to get my SCBA straps undone. I, Chief helped me. Uh, I was able to situate myself. Chief was able to ease my SCBA pack off my shoulders. And with that off of me, 
I was able to dig my elbows in and use the ground ladder that was placed under my feet to back out of the hole that I made when I fell through. Um, again, I was quite shaken up. Uh, Chief got me downstairs right away. The incident commander had called for an Well, we had an ambulance already on, on the scene. Um, they, they took me uh, right into the rig. I, I happened to know the paramedic uh, who was working that evening. She was a, a friend of our family. Um, got all checked out. Uh, the thing for me, having this happen again, um, it was it was very embarrassing. Uh, it uh, again, I, I to me, my pride was hurt at that time more than anything else. I did not uh, receive any treatment in the ambulance other than blood pressure. Um, taking my vitals, I refused treatment, and uh, at, at, at the hospital, um, I did not want to be transported. Um, in retrospect, I probably should have because I was very sore for uh, uh, quite a few weeks afterwards, my, my neck and my shoulders, et cetera. Uh, it was, you know, quite a sudden jolt and, and jar to the body. So, um, that, uh, so you that probably had some soft tissue injuries. Probably. Yeah. I had some, I did have some bruising, um, uh, things like that. Uh, luckily no broken bones, no, no burns. Um, the, the takeaway for me was I should have known better. I, I really should have. No better uh, than what? That I didn't test the floor uh, when I was when I was you know walking up there. Um, somebody had said to me that the incident commander said that the floors were compromised in the structure. I did not hear that transmission, so. Um, I can't say if that is, is that is correct or not. Um, so I, uh, again, uh, a very, very bruised ego. Um, and, uh, I just, I think I, I should have known better. I, uh, probably, you know, it was, it, I got, I got the clear from our chief to, um, you know, go ahead and, and look around up there and see if there was any any fire that advanced overhead, et cetera. Um, I, I, I was very fortunate, and, and I, you know, I wanted to be able to share that. Mm -hmm. So you guys weren't looking for victims. You were looking for fire extension. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And how many firefighters were in the house in total, your um, estimate, when this happened? On the second floor, there was a crew of, I believe, four on the hand line that was working that um, that uh, BC corner bedroom, and uh, I was with my chief and uh, one other firefighter uh, that had gone up originally to check for extension, pull ceilings, open walls, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, on the floor below me, there was our captain, and I believe he had a crew of three or four with him also, mm -hmm. uh, right below me, where I had come through the floor. Mm -hmm. um, did you have a radio with you? Yes, I did. And you, said, you said a mayday was called. Did you call it? Yes, I did. Okay. And does your department have, um, at the time, not now, but maybe at the time, did your department have, um, have had the firefighters been through training on May Day? Uh, no, sir. Okay, so when you call it a May Day, that, that didn't necessarily set any 
already established procedures into play as to what they would do now that a May Day has been called? No, no. Okay. Um, I will say, I, I, as I reached for my, my uh, mic on my radio strap, uh, it was like almost simultaneously that I could hear the uh, incident commander out front on the A side uh, yelling that we have a firefighter down. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the noise was loud enough. Mm -hmm. um, he was close enough to the structure um, to, 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 to hear what had happened. And again, it was like almost simultaneously. So I called one May Day, um, and then he, he said that we got a firefighter down on the second floor. Let's get some guys in there to help him out. Okay. And the crew below me had known what had happened too. Um, and that's when they got the ground ladder in there and uh, propped it up underneath me. And at the time, would the department have had in place uh, any policies and procedures for rapid intervention? Um, I don't know if any departments uh, were called to uh, to be a RIT team that, that evening on that alarm. Uh, I know our department has been called numerous times to provide RIT service if needed. Um, on this alarm, I don't know... Um, if anybody was charged, any department was charged with that task that evening. Okay. Well, would you have heard on the radio, you know, a, yes. a call for a writ team activation if they had been uh, in place? Well, they would have, during the initial dispatch, um, they would have said Lakeside, uh, we'll use Lakeside for an example, Lakeside, you uh, you will be the writ team on this alarm. Oh, so, so they tell them that when they dispatch them? Yes, yeah, sir. And you don't recall anybody being dispatched to be the RIT team for that alarm? Uh, no, I did not hear that. What tr what triggers the decision as to whether a department's going to get called to be the RIT team um, for a call? Um, I I honestly don't know. Okay. Uh, I I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Was this was this dispatched as a structure fire? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. Um. And then you guys were, uh, are you automatic aid or mutual aid? Uh, this was mutual aid. Okay. They, they called for another engine. Okay. Uh, we we were dispatched. And how many firefighters would you estimate were on the scene by the time you guys arrived? Uh, I know you said you were about you know ten or twelve minutes to get there. How many firefighters were on the scene when you got there? I would I would dare say, um. Between the home department, oh, in the neighborhood of, um, say, 35. Okay, so there were 35 on the scene when you guys arrived? Yeah. Okay. So there was enough, arguably, to have a rapid intervention crew right. designated. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. Whether that had happened or not, I, I don't know. Okay. I never asked the question yeah. uh, if somebody was uh, providing uh, as a RIT team that evening or not. Mm -hmm. Now, after, um, it's always a curious thing is to see what happens to the firefight after um, there's a mayday and a firefighter's down. Um, did it affect the... Uh, actual fighting of the fire as the attention of the incident shifted toward the firefighter down? No, I do not believe so. Uh, the the handline crew that was up on the second floor, um, I think it was business as usual. They they continued the attack on the, uh, you know, on the fire room. Um, the fire was probably, on the second floor? Yes. Okay. And I, I would dare say, at that time, by by time everything happened, I dare say that the fire was was pretty well knocked down. Okay. All right. And uh, 
How many? And I know you said this was a large house. What's the estimated? Give me an estimated square footage so I can at least get into the minds of the listeners. How big a big house is? Oh goodness, I, I'm not. I'm not very good at, at measurements. Um, All right. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't help you there. Okay. Uh, would you say um, twice the size of an average person's house? Yeah, it was. It was. We we called it a farmhouse. Okay. Okay. And it was old, like a farmhouse. Yes, it was. Okay. Right. Um, we were in and out again. It was in, in, in serious, serious disrepair. Mm-hmm. Uh, people had lived there. People had moved out, back in again, moved out. Mm-hmm. Uh, these paper and mail stacked up in the mailbox and on the front porch, etc. Mm-hmm. What's the status of that house today? Um, I believe it's still standing. Whether it's uh, been habitated or not, I don't know. Okay. I just wondered if they fixed it or tore it down or just boarded it up and left it. Um, what'd you learn from this? Well, not to be complacent. Um, be aware of your surroundings. I think, like I said, when I I probably let my guard down personally when um, we were going to the scene and responding to the scene. Okay, great. They already got hand lines working. They've established a water supply. You could hear all the action going on via radio. Um, Maybe that's when I let my guard down. Uh, I know, I know now and subsequent alarms I've been on um, I am on, I am on high alert, uh, <laughs> just so something like this does not happen again. It's amazing how, how your level of alertness changes after you almost die, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, the eye opener, I guess. Mm-hmm. And what, so what, what advice would you give to a young firefighter? You know, you got 41 years on, so, you know, it's arguably that it's heading toward the day where you need to pass the torch or pass your knowledge on. So you've got a group of firefighters that all, say, have two or less years experience, and you come into the kitchen table, and they're all sitting around, and and you want to share with them some of the wisdom that you now have as a result of this call. What would you tell these young firefighters? Uh, Please... Take your training seriously. Um, this is uh, this is not a football game. Uh, you're you're not going to cross a goal line, and everything is going to be over. This is a job, whether it's volunteer or career, that just keeps evolving and evolving and evolving. Um, if not, you don't play it that way you're going to get seriously injured or worse. Um, I, I would also like to say that as a department, the chief officers, line officers, really need to enforce uh, building construction. They need to really enforce May Day procedures slash protocols. Um, Drill on that. Uh, the old adage, you know, you got you 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 need to uh, play and drill the same way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it, it, it starts in the firehouse. Um, we are not invincible. Uh, we we've got to be aware of what is happening around us uh, constantly, constantly from the time the alarm goes out until the rig is backed in. Um, that's what I would like to impart on, on the, uh, say, the younger generation. Yeah, good, good, solid advice there. Did, uh, did the, was there any kind of um, uh, after action 
review or a get together of the departments involved to kind of see collectively um, lessons learned or things that could be done different or better as a result of what happened to you? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, we had what I thought was a fantastic opportunity. Um, I belong to a department that is part of a coalition of, I believe, eight other departments. At the time we were teaching Firefighter One, I was kind of hoping that the instructors would um, come up to me and say, hey, John, would you like to share your story of what happened that evening? Um, you know, not, not get into a whole lot of detail, but just get it out there how quickly situations can change on you. Uh, I was never asked to comment on it. Um, our, even our home department during drill, it was kind of like, um, let's maybe stay away from that. And I, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I should have uh, pushed the issue, but deferring to my chief officers and line officers. Um, we, we just left it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get a chance, uh, you know, other than like on the show here with me, do you get a chance to share this story and lessons with, uh, with others in your area or have you had that opportunity? No, I have not. Okay. Well, all the better to, that you uh, get the chance to come onto this venue of this format of the uh, podcast and to and to share the lesson because it really was a close really close call and uh you know if you'd have went all the way through that floor i mean you could have ended up landing on someone else and, yeah. and causing them a, a significant injury or if you had no one else to break your fall it could have re resulted in, in uh, you know you could have broke your back you could have broke who knows what yeah. Yes. Um, hmm. Let me think if there's anything else that I could. Uh, is there anything else that you would want to uh, share that you maybe haven't had the chance to say yet? Because I didn't ask you the right question. Um. The the main thing I I, I think that we we missed uh, we left the we were left at the station. Um, and I, and I mean the train station, I'm being facetious here, we, we, we missed an opportunity to maybe um, touch some budding firefighters in that Firefighter 1 class. Um, I am not the type of person that likes to toot his own horn, but I think I do have a... Uh, a good story to share again, the kitchen table story of how quick the situation could change. I, I think we missed, we really missed that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, again, deferring to instructors, I, I know that instructors are bound by um, content and time constraints of the subjects that they're teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, I do feel that although it may not have been as uh, dramatic of an incident, it, for me it was. Um, it wasn't the fire porn incident, for lack of a better term, but I think to impart on new minds and impressionable minds what this, what this game is that we play, uh, and take seriously, uh, I think it, it would have been a good addition to, the, to uh, one of their sessions. Yeah. Well, on the upside, you will now have forever a permanent link to this podcast that you can at least point students or instructors into the direction and say, look, you might not have time to cover this in class, but get your students to go on iTunes or onto Stitcher Radio and download this uh, interview and make it a homework assignment for them to, to do that and then come back and 
and and just have a conversation about how important it is, as you say, to not be complacent and to always be on guard. And I think that would be a really powerful lesson. You just gave that lesson not only to all the firefighters around Syracuse, you gave that lesson to firefighters around the world. And for that, I thank you. Thank you. I think Rich's, Rich's ability to, to, to connect with any crowd, that's a, that's a gift that he has, and, it, and it's easily transferable. This is the second or third time that I've heard him speak. There's some teeth to, to the information that he, that he brings. It's been really good. Good mixes. He knows when to throw in a joke here and there to get you back involved. Some tools. Um, I'm a new lieutenant, so very, very interesting. And some of these things I can take back to the station and use with some of the new firefighters I have my, on my crew. Something to get you thinking about your job more, big picture type stuff. I've seen him before. A good review for sure. I have heard him before, yes. After he speaks, there's usually an enlightenment because now they're more aware of what's going on around them and what they're experiencing as they're responding to calls. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable. I'm enjoying it so far. And that intuition, that's a big one. Um, the video that you just showed up here, we're getting a lot out of this. this is, I think this is a really good seminar, especially for new people and old. But I think it's, it's very informative. This talk gives us more ammunition to, to do all three. They're relatable to what we have experienced or very well could experience, so he makes it easy to let the knowledge sink in. I mean, it's awesome. A lot of stories you can usually relate to yourself and, and calls you have been on, you know, aha moment. Like, he just helps you focus on picking out the right things. It's, it's awesome. It's a refresher and keeps my eyes open. It's good stuff. If people listen to the message that he has, it's an incredible message delivered by a very com compassionate person. Strategy and tactics are going to always change. Situation awareness is it doesn't change. You're all, it's always there. He's got some good stories to tell and he's very thorough with his stories and it's uh, interesting listening to him. Very clear speaker and he, he talks um, on our level because he's been there, he's been in the trenches. I think he's doing well and I'm looking forward to the second half. Thank you, John, for participating in this interview and sharing your lessons learned with our listeners and viewers. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and more than 67,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, school bus drivers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you work in a high-risk, high-consequence decision-making environment, we're here to help to improve your safety and your survival, and to help you accomplish the most important goal of all, and that's to go home to the ones who love you. Welcome to Chief Miller. Chief Miller operates the largest social media page dedicated to the men and women of the fire service from around the world. Check him out on Instagram at Chief underscore Miller. Find him on Twitter at Chief underscore Miller. And check out the website where you can find Chief Miller Apparel at ChiefMillerApparel.com. I would like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters training for their team members. Eagle Materials Corporation in Grapevine, Texas. The Odessa Fire Department in Odessa, Texas. The Columbia Shoe Swap Regional District in Salmon Arm, British Columbia. The Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. The Minnesota Fire Chiefs Association Conference in St. Paul, Minnesota. The Association of Canadian Ergonomists Conference in Sudbury, Ontario, and the Loudoun County Fire Officers Seminar in Loudoun County, Virginia. And by the time this episode airs, I will have completed two programs for the Clearwater Regional Fire Service in Alberta, Canada. If you're interested in attending an upcoming program, here's where we're going to be. On November 3 and 4, I'll be doing two programs for the Anderson County Fire Department in Anderson County, South Carolina. On November 7, I'll be uh, hosted by the University Heights Fire Department in University Heights, Ohio. On November 8, I will be presenting at the Volunteer and Combination 
Officers Section Symposium in the Sun in Clearwater Beach, Florida. On November 14th, I'll be hosted by the Rogue Interagency Training Association in Medford, Oregon. On November 19th, I'll be hosted by the Shoreline Fire Department in Shoreline, Washington. And then from November 24 through December 11, I will be at the Sincrude Oil Refinery in Fort McMurray, Alberta. To see the locations of all the upcoming Situation Awareness Matters tour stop events, just head over to the samatters.com website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Live Training Dates. If you're interested in hosting a program, just go to the website and click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the homepage and I'll give you a call. If you want to be become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Just check the show notes for how to get connected with us through the newsletter membership, podcast subscription, new, the YouTube subscription, and how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 236 of the SA Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, firefighter John D'Antuano, for sharing the lessons from your near-miss event. Thank you to our awesome sponsors, Midwest Fire and Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, and organizations that have hosted Situational Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted a live, virtual, internet-based training event. Thank you to the more than 2,500 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there. And may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gasway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgasway.com.